Uh, we've got a great conference coming up. We saw that one going down in Canton, but right here in another two months, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary as a church. We're very excited about that, and uh, so we're calling everyone together for a conference, and we've got some, uh, I've got, I got a list of who's coming. Uh, we've got Chris Vallotton coming, uh, Mark Sharona, I don't know if you remember Mark, amazing guy, he's one of the most dynamic preachers that I've heard in a long time. Graham Cook is doing one session. He's not able to come here uh, because of situations going on there, but he's, he's sending us a session uh, just for this uh, gathering coming up in celebration of our 25th anniversary. And also this week, Brian Simmons came on board. Brian Simmons is the author of the Passion uh, Translation of the Bible. He is, I've known him for years, a great guy, a uh, good preacher. And I just, I mean, I enjoy the, how many of you have the Passion Bible? Any of you have that translation? Look at that. It's, I, I mean, it's a, I, he's got a great story about how that all came about. I hope he has time to share it when he's here. But anyway, he'll be here at the conference too. We're going to have a great time. So be sure to sign up. The price does go up a little bit somewhere in the near future. I don't know where, but end of July. Oh, end of July, very near future. So be sure to get in. You're going to want to be a part of this. We're going to have a great time, great prophetic ministry, and just fun together. So anyway, that's coming up. This is the last of my uh, series that I've been preaching on. Oh, there it is, the prophetic church. And the prophetic church, I'm preaching on it because every church, in a sense, should be prophetic. You know, the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you talk about Jesus, anytime, that's why when we sing that song, Yeshua, you know, when you sing it, it entertains something of destiny because it's in the name of Jesus. When you speak the name of Jesus, when you testify about Jesus, when you talk about Jesus, I believe when you just mention his name in faith, it changes the atmosphere and all of a sudden everything shifts around you. In fact, the very spirit of prophecy comes into your world. That spirit of prophecy is an atmosphere of understanding, an atmosphere of revelation. And we are in times right now like no other time I think in my lifetime, maybe, in the, maybe 1968 was a, a rougher time, you know. But I, I, I look at what's going on in the world, I, get my, my, I call them my spidey senses, I got to think of a spiritual term for that, but they go off periodically and I realize, yeah, oh, like something, you know, I feel nefarious kinds of things that are happening and things we don't know of. And, you know, I'm not a conspiratorial guy, but I can be, if you give me a minute. I just, I just, I, I see these things and I think, oh, man, that's, that's really kind of amazing. And over the past two years, we've experienced so much. And I want to just talk about this in conclusion. I want to talk about waiting and delay. How many of you are familiar with delay? I think I mentioned it two weeks ago, <laughs> the story of Ezekiel when he was plucked up by the Lord and planted down by the river Chabar. And Chabar means wait, <laughs> wait a while. You know, so it, sometimes the Lord plucks us up and puts us into a place where we are learning to wait upon the Lord. And in that time, the promises in your heart get tested. There's, a, there's some great passages on it, and I, I don't want to go through all of them right now, uh, you know, because I'm a little hungry, and at 12.30 we've got a, uh, uh, or 11.30 we've got our picnic starting here, and we have a good time. But, you know, there's so many stories about this where people have been put into situations where they had to wait scripturally. And yet the scripture is very clear that we learn how to wait in a right way. I want to I just give you a few verses here. I mean, Corinthians, uh, you don't have to turn to this one. I just want to quote it, and then I'm going to get to Habakkuk in here in a, a minute. It says, for all of the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, Brian Simmons, in his passage translation, he says that same verse this way. For all of God's promises find their yes of fulfillment in him, and as his yes and our amen ascend to God, we bring him glory. There's this continual partnership I talk about all the time. You know, whatever you, Jay referred to it or someone did earlier, that we bind on earth and be bound in heaven. I just preached on that two weeks ago. And there's something about, remember I said, we do, he do? <laughs> what we do, he do. <laughs> when we do something, we bind on earth, it's bound in heaven. We think it would be the opposite. What he does, we do. Which obviously he has commanded us to do certain things. But actually, our earthly actions mean something. How you respond in a situation like we're in right now, 
what seems to be continually unfolding, how we respond is, is virtually, is, is seriously important to what happens in your life and what happens around you. Because your actions are reflected in heaven. And by the way, your actions can also be reflected in hell. You know, you know when, you, when you engage in sin, there's a, there's a wage attached to it. The wages of sin, which is so like the devil, there's, you know, you pay for it. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God, the gift versus the wages. That's why Brendan can go to sleep and solve a seven million dollar problem. That's why in the first anniversary of my father's death, I was still grieving over my father until I went into a dream that night and the Lord showed up in his car, in my father's car. We were driving through the metro parks. I was in the back seat. The Lord didn't say anything, but a bird landed on my arm. When that bird landed on my arm, I know this sounds really weird if you're visiting. I do not dream that way every night, but in this night I did. And I woke up laughing. When the bird landed on my arm, I got hit with laughter. I mean, the kind of laughter that wait, you wake up laughing. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. And my wife, of course, sleeping beside me, said, what are you doing? I said, I'm laughing. Do you mind going in the other room and laughing? You know, <laughs> no, she wasn't like it. But so it was the Spirit of God just coming. And, and I realized the next day I had been freed. Jesus drove my dad's car with me in the back seat and a bird landed on my arm. Tell that to somebody. You're going to end up in an institution somewhere. But anyway, I was set free. It was just like, boom, the grief was gone on the anniversary of my father's death. So that gives me courage to know God works the third shift. Baby didn't like that one. He's 24-7, even while you're sleeping. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> even while you're sleeping. <laughs> she did it again. Even while you're sleeping, the peace of God, the, me- the Lord can heal you in your dreams. I love that kind of stuff. Turn with me to Habakkuk. Habakkuk says this. Chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Let me speak this into the very soul of every person here. The vision, the promise, the dream, whatever you want to call it, it's actually tweaked a little bit. This is repeated in the New Testament. It's funny how biblical writers do that. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. God's got something planned for your life, every one of you here. It doesn't matter how big or how little you think your life is. God has an appointed time in your life. And it says, but at the end... It will speak and it will not lie. And, and, and it says, though it tarries, how many of you know things tarry? <laughs> though it tarries, wait for it. It's funny, the literal Hebrew here infers panting. <laughs> it's an intent like somebody who's thirsty. Thirsty. It says, I know, I know, you're waiting. You're waiting for that glass of water. You're waiting for that fresh drink, whatever it might be. You're waiting for it. You, oh my goodness, when's it gonna get here? I'm thirsty. You know, if you've ever been that thirsty, you know what I'm talking about. And vision is a very similar thing, and you have longing when you get something from God. As a prophetic church, this has happened over and over again in the lifetime of this church and the churches I've been at before. I mean, when I first, the Lord first spoke to me about going to Canada in 1983, and I was excited about it, man. I saw a vision. I was at a church in Canada that had a balcony, and I walked to the front, because we were doing a wedding there, it was in uh, 1983, walked to the front, and I turned around, when I turned around, up in the balcony, I saw as clear as a bell this vision of the Holy Spirit behind bars, and I know it doesn't sound theologically correct, it's just what I saw. But he was rattling the cage, and the Lord spoke to me and said, if you will come here, you will be a part of unleashing the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I'm not the guy, obviously. I'm a part of it. But it it gripped me. It gripped me so much that I was passionate about it. And I get passionate about stuff really fast. If a bird lands on my arm and I'm delivered, you know, I, I, things happen. You know, it's like, wait, 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 hurry. (laughs) It's like that old red light, green light game. Remember that? Some of you born in the 60s and 70s, you remember school ground, playground, 
usually it was the guys lined up on one side, it really wasn't fair. Girls on the other, you know, because guys used this chopping motion, you know, when they would come through, things like that were totally illegal <laughs> in, the, in the rules. And uh, I'm sorry, that was Red Rover. Yeah, thank you. No one corrected me either. <laughs> Red light, green light is where somebody is it. And they say green light, their, their eyes are covered, they say green light, and then you run, they say red light, you've got to stop. And if they turn around and see you still moving, you have to go back to where you were. And so it was, it was this anticipation of green light, red light, and you have to freeze. Sometimes it was like if you had a really smart, tricky person doing it, they'd go red light, and you'd stop, and they'd go red light, but you thought they were going to say green light, you'd start to move, they'd catch you, and you'd have to go back. Thus is the kingdom of God. <laughs> That's my sermon for the day right there. That's it. It's running and stopping and waiting. And then running and stopping and waiting. And then running. And you say, how can I live my life that way? You can. You can. You learn scripturally you learn how to live your life in that waiting period, in that in-between period, from faith to faith and strength to strength and glory to glory. You know, the hell in the hallways thing. It's, it's right there between the strength and the strength is waiting. And so in 83, you know, I came up with this great word. My friends, my brothers, my associates, they, they didn't understand the word. And the bottom line of that was it took me three years to finally get in a car full of, uh, in a truck full of my goods and move up to Canada. And for someone 20, you know, 26 years old when I first saw that, when I was 26, you know, when you're in your 20s, everything seems like it, it needs to happen right now, right now. You get in your 60s, it might not even happen. <laughs> You've lived a life where you thought, this is not for sure. And you, you can get pronounced words of God. I mean, these powerful Words of God in your life. And I've had some of my life, you know, and I think, woo, in my 20s, I'd be like, yeah, I got the good, great word, man, this is going to happen. I'm going to be able to minister in this way, blah, 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 whatever it might be. And then, and then you get like seven years of waiting. Five years of waiting. Ten years of waiting. There's some things I've been waiting for over 30 years. There's one thing I've been waiting for since 1975 when the Lord through my pastor told me that if someone was smart, they would go to Brunswick and plant a church and that revival was coming. So that was, how long was that? Someone quickly add that up. 40, 46 years ago. Then in 1985, um, while I was in the hallway between uh, being released and then going to Canada, there was this little three-year period, you know, that I was floating around trying to figure out what God was going to do with my life in my late 20s. And during that time, the Lord spoke to me at, at I was 28 years old, and said, uh, uh, get all the pastors in the city together, which never happened, but this is what I heard. Get all the pastors in the city together and, and have a seven-day prayer meeting over Halloween week, seven days, and call it Quake on the Lake. And he gave me a scripture out of Acts where Paul and Silas were in prison. And when they prayed together, the building that they were in shook. The doors opened up wide. Even the jailer came to the Lord. At that time, Cleveland was like number one in the nation for the distribution of pornography. We were specifically going after pornography. And so we, I, I thought, you know, we're going to do this. I got excited. I rented the, the floor, top floor of the Holiday Inn down on Lakeside, you know, the 18th floor, which had significance to us. And and we were excited about it, you know. And so I get these pastors together. I think about, I don't know, 50, 70 of them, something like that. We had 120 churches. I mean, I, I just, I had this little church of like 150 people. I, I was 20, uh, at that time, I think 28, 29 years old. And, uh, but I just thought, well, here's what we're going to do. I, I never thought that people wouldn't want to do it. We got them together and everything. And so, you know, somehow there was a mix-up in the letter that my secretary sent out. Uh, we were having the breakfast on Rockside Holiday Inn, but the event itself, the 24-7, seven days of prayer, would be at Lakeside, downtown Cleveland. Well, what happened was all the pastors got Lakeside. I was at Rockside with about 80 meals waiting, you know, and I thought, this is the craziest thing ever. Can you imagine the time comes where everyone's supposed to be there and no one shows up. 
except me and my secretary. That was it. How the where could they be? You know, and I'm like, well, how could this happen? All of a sudden, I get a phone call. We didn't have cell phones back then. They called the, the uh, Holiday Inn. They came and got me. I went and got on the phone, and it was the key speaker, this guy named John Beckett, who's the founder of, of uh, Intercessors for uh, America. And I was so excited he agreed to come and speak at this breakfast, you know, and he said, Steve, we got 50 pastors down here, and I'm down here at Lakeside Holiday Inn. What do you want to do? And there's a little 28-year-old me like, I don't know. <laughs> and I, uh, so quickly, I, I said, can you tell them that this is an attack of the enemy to stop prayer in this city and please invite them to come and have lunch with me out here at Rockside. And so he talked to the guys. We lost a few guys, but honestly, it fired them up. They all came out there. We had a week of prayer. Great things happened. And, and so I'm being interviewed the week of, and uh, uh, it was a w, uh, WZLE was interviewing me, which was like the fish now. And they were interviewing me, and they said, you know, what are you, what are you doing this for? And I said, I believe that we're going to have prayer to shake a city. That's why we call it quake on the lake. Paul Silas, prison shaking, doors open. Doors are going to open in Cleveland. People are going to be set. Chains are going to fall off. Even the jailer, those who are uh, propagating this pornography and drugs and everything else and, and the crime that was in the city at that time, it's, you know, it's going to fall off because we've agreed together in prayer 24-7 over Halloween week. You know, this is a really exciting thing. So I'm telling it, and what I didn't realize, I said something in the midst of it, and I said, she goes, well, how, how, are, you, how are you sure that this is going to happen? She goes, and I said, I, honestly, I didn't think of this ahead of time. I said, I believe an earthquake is coming to Cleveland, and when it does, it'll be a sign that God's bringing a revival to this city. I mean, as soon as I said it, I thought, you ever wanted to reel words back that you said? You know, you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you know, I, I, mean, I may have been exaggerating a little bit on that, you know, but I, but I stood there. She goes, really, an earthquake? And I doubled down. I was just, you know, I was 29. You do that when you're 29. I said, yeah, yeah, I, I believe there's going to be an earthquake, you know. She goes, okay, you know. And so, you know, of course, there was no earthquake that week. But what happened was three months later, we had the largest earthquake in Cleveland's history in January of uh, 86. And when, it, when it, that quake hits the city, I got phone calls from all over the country. People are calling and saying, hey, can you come to our city? It's like, this isn't a quake on the lake, you know, mission or something. I, and, but, but I was sure. I was so excited. I thought, whoa, okay, revival's coming to Cleveland. That was 1984 that the earthquake happened, January of 84. So here we are now because the revival that has been described over the years has not yet happened in this city. So what do you do during that waiting time? You do what Jeremiah did. Do what Jeremiah did. You do what Habakkuk said, you, you learn, though it tarries, wait for it. So we're celebrating 25 years here. You know why I'm still here? I mean, I get, I get, like, like, I get draw to sunnier places. I get draw to, you know, uh, other parts of the world. and kind of Just, you know, so exciting, the world that's out there. You know why I'm still here in Cleveland? Because I'm a guardian. <laughs> no more Indians. I'm a guardian. I saw that yesterday and I didn't like it. Over 100 years of Indians. I mean, I get it. I understand what's going on in culture right now, but, you know, that kind of change I'm not up for. But I heard guardian. I thought, I did a stupid logo, but anyway, I'll, I'll get... I'll get over it, you know, guardian. And then I thought, well, guardians, I have always been impressed with the guardians of traffic. I mean, they've got that real feel of just protecting the city or whatever. Okay, I think the Lord's going to use this, you know. But here we are all these years later, you know, some 40 years, whatever it is, and I'm still, every morning I get up, and during the day at some time it comes to my mind that we are in the outer edges of an amazing revival that is coming. But we've got to learn to wait. But waiting in God is different than waiting. And waiting in our world in the natural is usually sitting in a chair and waiting. Your food's not ready yet. You wait. Happened to be a winking lizard last night. They brought the wrong fries out. I wanted the kind that's going to destroy my heart, apparently. <laughs> Fred's fries. <laughs> So I, got, I had to get Fred's fries, so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. This is the way we wait. We wait. We don't do anything 
I ate a little bit of popcorn while I was there, but we don't do anything. But in the kingdom of God, the waiting is different because once you have the word, you know what's going to happen. You know you will know when it happens. So now you can be at peace and do what he's called you to do. And in Jeremiah, it's brilliant. I love Jeremiah for this. I wish I could go a little deeper into it. But this is in 597 B.C. 597 B.C., 3,000 people were taken captive in Israel. And they were sent to Babylon. And so the prophet that emerged during that time was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, uh, there's this prophetic letter to, this is a letter to Babylonian captives and false prophets were all around, and they were all saying, it's just going to be a short period of time, and we're out of here. And so people were getting their hopes up, like, woo, okay, well, I, I can put up with a month or two of captivity and being a slave, you know. But, the, but Jeremiah knew it wasn't going to happen. Jeremiah knew it was going to be 70 years. Everyone say 70 years. 70 years. That's a long time to wait for a promise to be fulfilled, a prophet to prophet, a prophetic word to come about, you know. So 70 years, so Jeremiah's not real popular because he's got this long-term dream that we're going to be here a while. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that COVID is going to be a while, around for a while. No one wants to hear that there's going to be an annual vaccine that we're all going to take, you know, uh, because they, I heard it on the TV last night. They said, they said it's, it's now in our, our viral system and it will be popping up now all the time, and there'll be shots, you boosters or whatever you got to take. And so it's like, oh no, you know, you got you got flu hanging around every year, and you got you know all kinds of shingles and everything else, and you get shot. I mean, you can either look at it that way, or you realize that we are going through something, and in one sense, it doesn't matter because we are clinging something that is bigger than all of that. And so Jeremiah knew it. He had a word. That's prophetic churches go through things like we're going through right now, like we went through last year, and come out on the other side, hopefully unscathed. That not even the hair of your head, as little as I have, the hair on your head is not singed. That your clothing doesn't smell like smoke. That's the intended preferred future by God for you in this situation. Now, if you take that as your understanding, you're going to not only survive in this situation, you will thrive in the midst of it. And when you go to Jeremiah's story, here's what Jeremiah said. He told her, and I remember getting all these false prophecies, people saying, you know, it's, everything's going to, it's going to be a swift collapse of Babylon, and we're going to return home. Jeremiah starts to write them, writing them about their conspiracy theories, some self-delusion here. I just wanted to clarify it. He says you need to get married. Why? Well, what's that going to do? It's a long-term vision. Get married. This may be for someone today. Get married. Build a house. Well, houses now take, what, six, seven, eight months, something like to build. So, you know, easily, if you're hearing Jeremiah's prophecy, you could go, okay, well, we got eight or nine months. I mean, I can get married and build a house in that time. Have kids. Okay, well, that's going to take a little time longer there. Add another month or two. Plant vineyards, huh? eat from the vineyard. Okay, now we're talking probably a year or two. I mean, vineyards, vineyards take like five to seven years before you can eat. So uh, five or seven, oh, well, I don't know, somehow we'll get through that seven years. And he says, and then marry off your children that they may have grandchildren. Well, now we're talking 20, 25, 30 years down the road, you know. What they didn't realize is, is in the midst of it, Jeremiah is saying, look, you don't know when this end's going to be, but you know the promises of God. That God will rescue you someday. But this is going to be 70 years down the road. You need to put your head down and begin to focus on that and begin to move through it. So what do I encourage people during this time? You are living a red light, green light life. You've got the understanding of what your life is about and what the destiny is. Keep your eye on that. But right now, get married. Get a job. Move out of the basement. <laughs> find a husband. Find a wife. I've been looking for it. Just, you know what? <laughs> no marriage counselor here or a dating counsel, but be who you are. Improve yourself in all ways you can and have a vision for your life and someone is going to be attracted to you. Yeah. Right. Really. 
They're, people are attracted. I mean, they, they think they're attracted because of your physical appearance or you're so smart or you're just kind of funny or whatever it is. What they're, they're being attracted to you because people of vision with destiny shine in a certain way. <laughs> doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. If you've got a dream for your life and you're moving toward that dream, it's attractive. It's only attractive to your spouse. It'll be attractive to many other people that will follow you in whatever you do. And so you get your mind right in the midst of all this and say, you know what, I'm going to do what I'm going to do life well. I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to pay my bills. I mean, Andre, Andre, stand up here. I just saw you over there. Stand up. Andre just, how many of you know Andre? I interviewed him about a year ago here. Andre is studying to be a podiatrist. And he uh, just this week passed his boards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, 20, 25%, right? 25% of the class did not pass the boards. Uh, so he passed the boards. I see him. He studies at Starbucks a lot. He studies here a lot. We let him come into the building and just use it as his private 16,000 square foot office here. <laughs> and uh, and he, uh, he told me today, he, I said, well, t- I, uh, give me the time. Like, wh- where are you on the doctor path, you know? And, and, and he said, I'm five-eighths of a doctor. So let's give him a hand for that. It's free. Three more eights to go. <laughs> but that's the idea, though. I mean, if the world's coming to an end, you just stop everything you do? No, you, you get married. You study for how long is it going to By the time you're done, how many years will it have taken? Uh, yeah, total. His degree's not in math. 11? 11 years. You imagine you have that in front of you, and I've watched him. Boy, he studies, man, yeah. 80, 90 pages. At a, I mean, it's crazy what he studies. But he sees the goal. He, is there ups and downs? Andre, are there any ups and downs in there? You're married, you have children? Yeah, yeah there's, there's ups, there's downs, but he's plowing away. I just want to commend you today for being someone who's waiting on the Lord <laughs> for this 11 years. It's pretty amazing. So I'm still waiting. I'm here today with you. And every time I come here, I feel like there's going to be a breakout of some sort. We've had some pretty good breakouts lately. But I feel that something is going to happen in this city that's going to be massive. It's going to be big. You know, in 1999, I just confirmed this today. Uh, For about a month, I was trying to confirm this. Because in 99, I had a, uh, a dream impression thing that came to me. It was very detailed, very clear about invasion from China in uh, the year 2020. And so I wrote it down. I can't find where I wrote it down, but I have repeated it over and over in the years. And as, as recently as 2019, I told a group, uh, one of them was actually Chinese uh, in the group, I told a group about what I had, and I, I said that the Lord showed me in 1999, so it's 20, 22 years ago, he showed me there would be an invasion from China, and it would change the way we do church forever. And, you know, and it's, I told a lot of people over the years, but of course, as you get closer to 2020, you're like, I think that was a. And so even when 2020 hit, like I just, last time I talked about this was in uh, August of uh, uh, 2019. And that's how I found it because the next Sunday, I talked about it here Sunday morning. So if you go on YouTube, you can see that September 1st, uh, 2019, I talked about how that I felt there was going to be an invasion from China. I felt from the beginning it was going to be an invasion of the uh, Chinese church. That that basically the depth of the underground church would be transplanted into the United States. And the United States would be changed in how we do church because of the Chinese way that God has moved through them over there. It wasn't until like June of last year in 2020 that I sat there one day laying in bed. I woke up early in the morning and I I was meditating on it. And I thought, wait, the the virus was the invasion. And it, by all likelihood, came from China. I never dreamed that, the invasion from China. But what did it do? It changed the way we did church for a season. It's almost like. I don't know. I honestly don't know the involvement of God in all this thing. Obviously, God is there. But God is going to use this to shake the United States of America. And I want to be on record today. I believe that we are in the midst of an invasion right now. 
we're going to feel it. This can be turned back, but this is going to bring America to a place of full and complete repentance unlike any time in its history. So it's going to be, it's difficult though. It's a difficult time. And so as we move into this difficult time, I, I want a heads up moment. I want everyone to know, I don't think all the days in front of us are going to be easy. In fact, I think there's going to be waves of stuff. Like someone who feels like they're drowning, they can get up and get a little bit of air. But all of a sudden they're back down, we get up and get a little bit of air. I feel that way over the past year. I think this is going to continue for a while. There's something going on behind the scenes, and this may never get on the internet, I don't know, but I, I, I really believe we're entering into something that, is, that has been planned for a long time. This, in my mind, it's not conspiratorial. I believe the Lord has spoken this, and it's going to shift the church. And right now is the time to learn how to be undergirded in the Spirit, to know how to be strong. And I don't want to collapse in the midst of this. I don't want to run over in a corner and cry, you know. I want, I want to come through this valiantly, like Andre. I want to be able to come through in the final moment, even though we may have to change and shift and do things very differently in the days ahead. I believe we will. And we're preparing for it. There's things I'm praying about right now, saying, Lord, what does the church look like in 2022? What does it look like in 2025, 2030? I don't know totally, but I'm learning as we go forward. And if this is all we ever do, I'm pretty happy with this. I enjoy this, you know. But there's something deeper. God's about to move. And the billion soul harvest that has been promised over and over again through numerous prophets is going to affect this nation in a powerful way and affect the world in a very powerful way. As we see almost like Haman's gallows that were built to kill Mordecai, at the end of the day, those gallows were being built for Haman himself. And so the movement, you know, we have powerful words, one of the most powerful prophetic voices in northern, in Scotland, a woman in 07 prophesied over me. First word she said out of her mouth, this is 07, she said, China, 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 seven times. The reason that was significant is because I brought a book with me to Scotland to read called Jesus in Beijing. And it was all about, it was a secular book all about the revival, the Jesus movement that hit China and what it did. And China is heavenly, heavy, heavy, heavenly. It's heavy infected with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So yeah, there's difficult and challenging things that happen. So here's the deal. She finishes that seven China and says, and Kevin McNeely was there actually, finishes that and, and she, she said that I see teams going out from your church over to cities in China that uh, Americans have not even been to yet. And the gospel of Jesus will be preached. So with all we're experiencing right now, I look at that and I go, Lord, I don't know if I want to go to China right now. But there's something in our future that is heavy. Why am I bringing this up today on picnic Sunday? It's a good question. <laughs> Should have waited until the next week. Because we're in a moment right now where you need to undergird yourself in the Lord. I was reading about Corey Ten Boom, if you've never heard of her. You know, she was in prison camp for several years with her sister. And uh, uh, she came out, toured America. And, I mean, she was one of the most, she was like a Heidi Baker of her time, very anointed woman. And she talks about the time that they were in prison and talks about how what they invested in their lives prior to prison sustained them in the midst of seeing all these people murdered and killed in the midst of it. God brought them through totally on the other side. Let me just tell you this. God will bring you through whatever's coming to America. But the time right now is to charge your spiritual batteries in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand together if we could. Whoa, Jesus. Sorry, I went a little bit older. Over. Um, somebody's going to come up in a minute and direct you what to do regarding the picnic. I hope all of you can stay. Feel free. We're going to have a lot of fun. Middleburg's going to be joining us in a little while, about an hour from now. So you get first dibs on the food <laughs> before they come out here. And uh, they'll come and tell you what to do. But right now, before we do that, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, or if you've fallen away, in some way, you've become moderate, you've become nominal. I'm telling you right now, this is not a time to be lukewarm or cold. It's time to be hot 
to the power and presence of God. If you're here and you just say, you know what, I, I kind of... I kind of, I don't know what you, I don't know about the China thing. I don't know what, what I believe about that, but I do believe there may be difficult times in our future, and I want to be made sure that me, my family, that the Lord is in our house. We will serve the Lord in the midst of it all. We will come through on the other side. In this period of waiting, I'm going to continue to do life. I'm going to do what Jeremiah said. I'm going to be a light in the midst of darkness. Not every president you want elected will be elected. Not every congressman, whatever, whatever thing. I mean, it's going to go back and forth and back and forth. But you are going to be steady in the love line of Christ. And so if you're here and you say, you know, I've never given my life to Jesus. Or you've wandered off. You say, I want to come home. I want to come back to Jesus. I'm just going to pray for you real quick. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. You can come up afterwards. I'll tell you about that. But right now, across this room, as I just look, if that's you, you say, that is me. We've had so many people this year give their lives to Jesus Christ. If that's you, starting over here on the left, anyone over here on the left, your right, my left, you just say, I'm, I'm away from Jesus. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Don't step out or anything like that. But raise your hand saying, I need prayer right now. If you're in this part over here, I see that hand right there. Anybody else? Thank you. Another one there. God bless you. Several ladies there. Anyone else? Don't want to miss anyone. Okay, in this center section right here. You do not know Jesus Christ or you've been away. Just raise your hand right now. God bless you, man. Yes, right here too. Anyone else? I don't want to miss you. Thank you for raising your hand. Over here, this section. Anyone? One. Right in the back. Thank you, sir. Anyone else say, you know, I've been away. I want, I want to come back to Jesus Christ. He is searching for you like the lost sheep, like the lost coin like the lost son or daughter, anyone else in this section, just raise your hand you say, that's me. We had probably about five to seven people raise their hand. Let me just pray for you. We're going to pray a prayer together. If you raise your hand, pray this in faith, which means you, you're saying, Lord, I'm speaking this. I love the man who said, I believe, help my unbelief. I mean, there's, it's okay. You're struggling, but you say, Lord, I, I'm longing for you. I'm longing for your ways. I want to get my life straightened out. Let's just pray this prayer, prayer together corporately. And those who raise their hand, pray from your heart sincerely. Lord Jesus, I come before you now. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my wrongdoing. May your blood set me free. I believe you died on the cross. I accept your gift of salvation. Come into my heart, mold me, shape me into your image, in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that and you meant it from your heart, what well, we believe, you've been born again. What we're going to ask you to do, there's a step you can take as soon as we dismiss in a minute. You come up, we have these teams in the front, they're lovely people that have been trained, <laughs> and you come up and just say, hey, I just raised my hand, they go, we have a book that we want to give you, we want to take a minute just to pray for you again. And we'd love to get to know you. If you'd like to do that, we'd love that too. So after we finish in just a moment, feel free to come forward and we'll minister to you up here in the front. Okay, Jay.